We're going to just give you a little update on practice around the anaesthesia associates um, this morning. Um, so anaesthesia associates, as you know, they've been around for over 20 years in the UK. Um, and our anaesthesia associates went through the, the Birmingham University two and a half year training programme supported by the RCOA. You, you probably also know that they're trained in all areas of anaesthesia pre-op. Um, conduct of anaesthesia and also post-op care. The initial scope of practice, essentially what they've been trained to do when they come out of that university course is, um, is such that for every case they need to be supervised by a consultant anaesthetist who has to be present and easily contactable, um, needs to be present in the anaesthetic room during induction of anaesthesia they should regularly review the interoperative management um, that the, the anaesthesia associates carrying out. They should be present during emergence um, until the patient's been handed over to recovery. And they should be they should be still available until you know full control of the airway reflexes has returned. So that's the kind of initial scope of practices that AAs had when they were trained. The Royal College of Anaesthetists. Um, uh, information for employers is all on the college website around AAs. They stated in 2016 that they're aware that um, AAs have been around for a long time and that certain extended roles were taking place within individual trusts. Um, and they they actually made a statement that they'd only support role enhancement when statutory regulation is in place. That's coming next at the end of next year, the GMC um, statutory regulation. Um, and so the responsibility where any enhancement of role exists would be a local governance issue for those individual trusts. And more clearly, when departments train their AAs to perform roles that extend beyond the initial scope of practice, that must be in line with the local government's governance arrangements. Uh, information for patients. Um, this is really obvious. Uh, you know, it's standard information that um, uh, patients should receive. Um, one of the professionals that you may meet as a member of the anaesthetic team might be an AA, and they are trained to perform your assessment, administer your anaesthetic, and work under the close supervision of a consultant anaesthetist. This is all relevant because of the extraordinary general meeting that's recently taken place. In terms of extended roles, if we look back to 2018, where there were around 137 um, uh, AAs working within the UK, you can see that even in 2018, there were a number of extended roles that were taking place, mostly around regional, but particularly around induction and emergence without the consultant anaesthetist actually standing in the room next to them. So that was already becoming pretty common. So, as you probably will know, there's been a recent uh, Royal College uh, extraordinary general meeting um, took place in October and it, it passed a number of uh, resolutions with really quite a huge majority. Um, the resolutions were that recruitment of AA should be paused until the RCOA consultation on the training impact, the impact on anaesthesia trainees is complete. And this was in order to ensure that doctors in training were given priority for training opportunities. So there was a feeling that AAs may be in some way impacting on the training places available for anaesthetists. Um, and going forward might, might affect it uh, uh, more so with the increasing numbers. Um, local opt-outs, in other words, these extended roles that I've mentioned, um, are not approved by the college. Um, and that was a resolution that was passed. And even though they, they're not particularly, as, as I said earlier on that slide, already clearly states on the college website that, um, that the college um, would leave it up to individual uh, trusts, whether they would allow extended roles or not. And then a member resolution on information patients should receive. Um, I think this is all fairly obvious information that RAAs give to patients anyway. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I, I think this came around because there have been one or two physician assistant incidents. There's particularly one in general practice where uh, there was a problem uh, with the with the physician assistant not introducing themselves properly. So what about NUH? Well, we've got four qualified an anaesthesia associates and we have four anaesthesia associates in training at the moment. Uh, our anaesthesia associates have been with us for over a decade, um, working both at City and at QMC, um, and they are valued members of NUH team anaesthesia. During and since the COVID-19 pandemic, the scope of practice of our AAs was further extended, really just to help out with the, uh, the huge stretch on our rotor at those times. Um, however, we've recently reviewed our anaesthesia associate practice, and we've done that by meeting with our anaesthesia associates and discussing um, their practice indeed with all stakeholders involved, so a number of consultants and, and managerial people involved. Some of the issues that were highlighted by that process were that the, the AAs have been moved a lot on the day to plug rotor gaps, which has created supervision and patient complexity issues. Um, AAs and supervising anaesthetists were both covering lists with complex surgery and or patients on them. Um, as you'll know, a lot of our, our lists, both at Queen's and at City, contain complex patients, and that might prove difficult when either supervise, the supervising anaesthetist needs to supervise the AA or the AA needs a supervising anaesthetist to help them. Um, the supervising anaesthetist may have been unaware or unfamiliar with their supervisory responsibility when approached by the attending AA, which caused discomfort. Uh, the AA may have been working alongside an anaesthetist in training, who would then became the effective uh, supervising anaesthetist. Uh, AAs have been asked to work out of hours. Um, AAs have been supervised in emergency theatres on occasions by the QMC lead anaesthetist, which has caused problems when the lead anaesthetist had to leave theatres, etc. Um, and one or two reports of anaesthetists in training reporting missed training opportunities due to the presence of an attending AA in their theatre. And a lot of these issues uh, were, were reported to us by our own anaesthesia associates. So the conclusions from these uh, this, this assessment, if you like, uh, was that um, we've got varying degrees of AA supervision going on, uh, which potentially pay, places the patient, the supervising anaesthetist and the AA at risk. Um, there's definite pressure on supervising anaesthetists to do their own complex lists whilst trying to supervise an AA, which is clearly inappropriate. Uh, and this perhaps was leading to a creation of a divide between our medical staff um, and our AAs, possibly compounded by the, the negative social media coverage at the moment uh, around the uh, Royal College emergency uh, meeting. And there was a feeling really that our AAs were beginning to feel like a burden to the service rather than a help to it and starting to feel vulnerable in their own clinical work. So clearly uh, we felt that this was time for a change and a reset of what was going on. Um, so we have done exactly that. Uh, so we see the primary functions of our AAs in NUH um, to support long and complex surgical cases, uh, to help with providing flexibility, if you like, for anaesthetists working solo so that they can get breaks and see patients, etc. To improve patient throughput in busy surgical lists, which we know they've been doing for years already, um, to deliver anaesthesia care in a two to one supervision model um, in a clearly defined environment um, and to increase training opportunities for our anaesthetists in training. So I think what's important is for us uh, to realise that AAs are providers of anaesthetic care under direct supervision of a consultant or specialist anaesthetist. And that's a really important concept for us to, to sort of take forward. So we decided going forward that the following scenario should not therefore be allowable. So certainly the supervising anaesthetist cannot be an anaesthetist in training and an AA cannot supervise a junior 
uh, anaesthetist in training. We decided going forwards that working in emergency theatres at QMC in a two to one model is is not permissible going forwards. And this is really because the caseloads are so unpredictable um, and the difficulty in providing ad adequate supervision levels because of this means that it's just not a, a great uh, model for our AAs to be working in. And so until further notice, uh, we're proposing that our AAs will be deployed alongside a consultant or specialist uh, anaesthetist in the following areas in a one to one model. And these are these are sort of mainly elective areas that the AAs are familiar working in already or have told us that they're very comfortable working in going forward. This is not to say that we don't want our AAs to work in a two to one model, but what we what we actually want to do is develop specific timetabled, more elective two to one working um, uh, in the future in a, in a sort of elective uh, planned situation where we're not having last minute rated changes and difficulties in supervision. Just a quick word about supervision of our AAs, um, our experienced AAs um, who have um, signed off that what we call a multiple a multi trainer tool, which is an assessment of their competence by us as a department um, with the agreement of their individual supervising anesthetists may provide induction and emergence from G GA uh, for ASA one and two patients independently under local supervision subject to our own SAP and also deliver care to stable ASA three patients um, according to our SAP and uh, our experienced AAs will be able to tell you whether they had this signed off or not when you're supervising them. If you are supervising an AA, we have a new PSD form now, uh, which is essentially a statement of supervision, supervision um, spelling out our role in supervising the individual AAs and also giving our AAs permission to uh, give anesthesia drugs under our supervised um, authority. And this is a form that goes in the patient's notes and makes things pretty clear about supervision. So in conclusion, this re represents for us a reset of AA practice at NUH. Hopefully it protects AAs and supervisors and makes both parties feel comfortable in the roles that they're, they're fulfilling. It provides clarity for our, our, our uh, beleaguered rotor makers uh, and supervisors and AAs. And hopefully it will allow reintroduction of two to one models um, uh, of AA provision of anaesthesia care in a controlled and regular way. Um, that's all I've got to say. Thanks.